Hi, I'm Bill Crystal. Welcome back to Conversations. I'm very pleased to be joined today by a frequent guest, Paul Cantor, a professor of English at the University of Virginia. Uh, we've discussed Shakespeare, we've discussed popular culture, 19th century British novels, uh, 20th century American television. So uh, yet another topic today that I thought would be very interesting, given, Paul, that you've taught for almost five decades. It's hard to believe uh, in higher, at, at fine institutions of higher education at Harvard, where we first met, and then at UVA since, what, 1977? Wow. Seven. And uh, so let's talk about higher education. Uh, it, how's it doing in terms of educating people? How's it doing as a kind of institution in, in American in the American society and the American economy, are there? Uh, is it going to remain as dominant as it seems to be today? And in, in our overall uh, educational and, I guess, literary and intellectual life, uh, lots of interesting things to talk about. So, uh, okay, you've been teaching students for fifty years almost, and uh, uh, had colleagues for all that time at Harvard and UVA. What, what should I think about higher education? Just looking at it from the outside, should I be? Is it, is it as bad as I? Th- sometimes think it might be, or should I be a little cheered up because there are better things than I realize, or what's your general take, and, and how has it changed over the, all, those, all that time? Well, uh, I, I always try to be optimistic, and I hope you will be cheered up in this sense, that the students are still wonderful, uh, and it's a great thrill to teach them, uh, and uh, uh, the problems, I think, are largely institutional. That's what I'd like to talk about. I think higher education is in bad shape, uh, and unfortunately, it's the problems are becoming increasingly visible. For years, people have been uh, warning against the state of higher education. Uh, we were both friends of Alan Bloom back in the late 1980s. He made a name for himself with closing the American mind and suggesting what some of the problems in, in higher education were. And the, all those problems have only deepened uh, over the years. And uh, now, as I say, they've uh, it's almost as if... Uh, the whole of our society is being run like a graduate seminar uh, with the same emotions and the same uh, ideologies. What Alan never anticipated was social media. Uh, And that is what indeed has made it possible uh, for the world of higher education uh, to have a disproportional say in American discourse because uh, the kind of people who dominate social media are the kind of people uh, who are either in higher education or have emerged under its influence. Uh, and so uh, it really is a sad spectacle uh, to see that the kind of uh, critical thought which questions the value of American inst- institutions and the value of America itself has now gone mainstream and is dictating policies uh, uh, all over the country and dictating a level of rhetoric that uh, I have never seen in my lifetime. Uh, and it does make you wonder how much longer this can go on. I thought you were going to be optimistic here in your, at the beginning. and uh, Well, the, I did. I mean, I uh, we'll get to optimistic stuff later, but first we do have to assess okay. uh, the problem. So, in a certain sense, I'm a... T- I'm eternally optimistic with education because I think if you can get good teachers together with good students, something really marvelous happens. The problem now is how much is interfering with precisely that. Well, let's talk about that. So is the interference, you know, uh, ideological, institutional? I mean, is it the students aren't prepared enough so they can't even benefit from from the good teachers who are there? What is it the way faculty are selected? I mean, what, what, what are the kind of core issues, do you think? Well, I'd like to concentrate on the institutional aspect because I don't think that's sufficiently discussed. I mean, the the problem is fundamentally ideological, and the fact that various left-wing ideologies have come to predominate all over universities and colleges, and especially uh, in the liberal arts world, and especially in the humanities. But I think there's an aspect uh, to what's going on that is insufficiently noted. I don't think Alan noted it in uh, Closing the American Mind. Uh, and that is the issue of faculty governance uh, or faculty self-governance. Now, I can just hear people uh, turning off their TVs or whatever. No, now. no one ever turns oh, off. No, gonna, one ever, no one ever turns off a conversation. Just they're going to be talking about... S- 
faculty governance, but it's a really a very important issue, uh, and it actually goes to the heart uh, of how we conceive universities and how I would say we misconceive them. Uh, that is, uh, most universities, if not all now, look like corporations. Uh, they have a president, they got a busload of vice presidents, they've got some kind of hierarchical uh, structure, they have large endowments, investments, I mean, really they are to some extent and necessarily structured uh, as corporations. There's a certain irony in that, considering how anti-corporate most faculty are, uh, that somehow they seem to gravitate towards corporate organization uh, when largely left to them. Uh, cells. Uh, but in a way, this is uh, pretty new in the history uh, of universities. Uh, and uh, if I were offering an analogy uh, from economics uh, for uh, universities, I would say partnerships, that ideally uh, faculty are organized the way a partnership would be. Uh, and uh, this was true for most of the history of universities, and it's shown uh, in the uh, institution of tenure. Uh, that is what uh, differentiates universities from corporations, uh, is that faculty choose each other. Uh, uh, they hire each other, uh, and uh, this has actually even been recognized, I believe, by the courts in cases where faculties have tried to uh, unionize, courts have denied the, that on the grounds that they, uh, this is not a labor management situation uh, in a university because faculty hire each other. So they're not put in the normal place of labor vis-a-vis -vis, uh, management. If anything, they're closer to the management side of the equation than to the labor uh, side. And this is very important. I, I would say discussions of tenure often miss the point when the whole emphasis is on tenure as a free speech issue. That the reason we have tenure is so that faculty can have uh, the right to freely speak their minds. And that's very important and I, I value that aspect of tenure uh, very much. But there's another aspect to it and it is the fact that tenure is the foundation of faculty self-governance. Uh, they choose each other uh, they cannot be fired by anyone else, anyone supposedly higher up in the organization. Uh, and this to me is a very important aspect of uh, the situation in the university. And I would say that this has declined incredibly uh, in the 45 years or so, so that I've been uh, uh, involved in university uh, activities. Uh, Faculty self-governance uh, is almost gone now, uh, and but the don't faculty they still, know but it. They still select each other, and they still have ten years. Okay, okay, that uh, we'll get to that in a minute because that uh, university is trying to undermine that. Uh, uh, it's it's the last bastion of faculty self-governance. That's why I think tenure is so important, and it's what prevents administrations from uh, riding completely roughshod uh, over faculty. But I, f faculty members don't like to discuss this, but I think they're demoralized everywhere because they really feel that their uh, say in how the universities operate, operate is, is uh, almost completely eroded. I, I remember the days uh, when there'd be something like a faculty senate I mean, again, nominally, there still is at most schools. And it legislated matters. Uh, it determined the shape of the curriculum, uh, for example. Uh, uh, and that, to some extent, still happens. But largely, these sort of grand uh, curricular initiatives now all come from uh, a dean or a provost or sometimes directly from the president. And there, again, there's precedence of the, for that. In university history, there are famous presidents like uh, Robert Hutchins at, at Chicago, who led enormous curricular uh, restrictions, uh, revisions. Uh, but by and large, uh, as 
universities have gotten larger and more unwieldy, it has become increasingly difficult for the faculty to self-govern. Now, a tremendous element of that has been the federal government uh, and its increasing regulation of universities, which usually takes the form of paperwork, paperwork, and more paperwork. We are in a world now at universities where you have to certify everything 12 times, and frankly, the faculty can't handle that. And I think they've sold their souls to be relieved from the paperwork. Uh, just last week, I had to, I was just trying to get a grant for some of my graduate students. It's just involved distributing money to graduate students. I had to go through a 45 minute modular course uh, to learn how to experiment on human subjects. Uh, and then I had to go through another 45 minute course to learn how to deal with my patents and not to exploit my many, many patents. Uh, I'm alarmed. I'm alarmed that you're, a, that you're experimenting on human subjects there at Charlottesville. Paul. Well, you see, the point is I'm not experimenting <laughs> on human subjects, but the way things get categorized, everybody who gets a grant uh, has to prove uh, he or she knows how to experiment on human subjects. Uh, and by the way, the exam questions are pretty amusing and pretty easily figured out. I passed that one. I flunked the course on patents to tell you I had to take it over. Uh, but, I mean, really, this is what goes on at universities now. Uh, that was a, to a total of 90 minutes that I've wasted out of my life forever. <laughs> And it's unending that way, and, and what administrate uh, all these people that are brought in administrations, and there are vast numbers of them, are there to administer these grants and to do a lot of the paperwork for you. You still have to take the test on experimenting on human subjects, uh, but I I will, you know, I I understand what the situation is basically. Uh, the, the faculty have sold their birthright for relief uh, from paperwork. Uh, but it, uh, uh, there's a, another dimension to this, which is that these uh, administrations want more control over the operation of universities. And the biggest thing standing in their way is departments. Uh, and that means these bastions of tenure, uh, these departments, which are self-governing within themselves, largely to the extent that they hire each other. Uh, and somebody figured out that this was a problem. These university presidents go on these retreats all the time to some place in the mountains or on a beach somewhere. And I have figured out that what they learn at those retreats is how to undermine the power of the departments. Uh, and uh, you see in many uh, current trends in policy, for example, interdisciplinarity is one of the great buzzwords now in the academic world. Now, I'm pretty interdisciplinary myself, uh, and so I'm okay with it. Uh, but the uh, institutional manifestation of interdisciplinarity is the creation of these centers the Center for the Study of Physics and Biology, the Center for the Study of East European Studies of West Europe, and so on. And, the, and again, they often produce wonderful work, and it's a great way of bringing together scholars from different fields, and it can be genuinely productive. But what deans and presidents love about it is these are centers of power uh, that are not under the control of departments. Uh, and in many cases, uh, they don't quite have hiring ability, but it's awfully close. They get to make appointments, uh, appointments in the interdisciplinary field. And it usually means the department in one field has to approve it, the department in another field has to approve it. But these are always offered by deans and presidents as free. Uh, this will not count against your tenure limits in your department. So uh, most departments look at, oh, we get an extra faculty member. We don't have to pay the salary, and it doesn't reduce our other appointments. The result is to develop a segment of the faculty which is loyal directly to the dean uh, or to the president and not to any department. 
and it really works to diffuse the power of departments. Again, this probably sounds so Byzantine to most people, no, no, and it is Byzantine. But this what is, is how the, the Byzantine Empire operated. Well, but right. it show, it's So what's the effect? I guess that would be the question. I mean, why, why should one be nostalgic for a situation when I entered Harvard and you were t- just about the year before you began teaching there, you became assistant professor there? Uh, you know, there were all these departments that genuinely were self-governing. It sounds like a nice thing in some theory, but... In practice, it just meant a whole bunch of tenured professors could do whatever they want, pay no attention to teaching. Some of them were drunkards. Some of them were, you know, reading the same lecture they'd written 30 years ago. There was no uh, accountability, as we say these days. And I, was that such a wonderful teaching situation either? I mean, I mean, I mean, this is an honest question. I'm being rhetorical. But, you know, wh- why, why is it worse no, now I, in terms I mean, of the I, actual I, education? Uh, well, what it has empowered is all these movements to radicalize universities, okay. because very often the agenda of these interdisciplinary groups, uh, 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 institutions, is uh, to push uh, the diversity agenda or, or whatever. And you're seeing it. It is amazing the stuff that's going on right now. And I guess it's uh, rarely it's, to push uh, liberal education in a more traditional sense, right? And that's kind of that is what the departments sort of I would hang agree. To. I would agree. Yeah, and I think the whatever you say about the departments and they had problems and they continue to have problems, and uh, 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 they were focused on education to this extent that they respected their individual field and they generally hired by their field. And these are basically end runs by administrations uh, to hire according to uh, various political agendas. For example, a lot of these centers are for things like sustainability uh, or for various, you know, environmentalism is a great uh, area for interdisciplinary the disciplinarity. And so uh, if an uh, administration wants to push an environmental program and, you know, an anti-global warming program or whatever, the great way to do it is through these inter- interdisciplinary s- centers. Uh, I, c- I compare it uh, to Louis XIV uh, and Cardinal Richelieu. Uh, this is how the French monarchy became centralized. The thing that the French monarchy hated in the 16th century was all these independent feudal barons, all these dukes and earls and counts uh, who had their own little armies and their estates and their people were loyal to them. So the genius of Richelieu and Louis XIV was to bring all these nobles to Paris and make it so attractive who wouldn't want to go to Paris? Who wouldn't want to go to Versailles? It's where the action was. Uh, and it had a kind of uh, cumulative effect. For one thing, it took the people out of their estates. They lost touch with their own people. Uh, they no longer were in public in whatever little region of France they came from. And at the same time, it attached them more and more to Louis' court. And the result was the most centralized monarchy uh, uh, in Europe, and to this day, the most centralized country in the world, possible exception of North Korea, uh, that, that Paris ruled all of France. And that's the dream of these deans, provosts, and presidents. They really would like to rule all the university. And I sympathize with them in the sense that the faculty are very hard to manage. Uh, they, uh, they can't make decisions. Uh, I like to put it in, re- in response to Pearl Harbor. Uh, the faculty would have declared war on Japan on December 8th, 1947. <laughs> uh, to get faculty to act in a timely fashion uh, is very difficult. Again, I, I think in faculty have brought many of these problems on themselves. But the result is uh, uh, very powerful and hidden from most people's eyes. I don't think most faculty understand this. Uh, Now, for example, uh, to be appointed to head one of these centers is a real plum. Uh, You get a lot of power. You You get out to hire people on your own without the constraints of your department. You usually get a tremendous increase in your salary. And uh, I noticed that the central administration is very good at picking off distinguished 
and important faculty and getting them on their side and then the, the, those faculty members go out and sell the administration policies to the faculty uh, at, at large. Uh, and again, this is something that's been so striking to me. Uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, here at the University of Virginia, at one point, one of the presidents decided, you know, out of the goodness of his heart, he would address every faculty meeting. And this was really, uh, you know, this nice thing he was going to do, create more communication. The president should come to the faculty meeting. Now, he proceeded to speak for 50 to 70 percent of the scheduled time for the faculty meeting. And no faculty business took place, uh, but that's emblematic of what I'm talking about here. Yeah. And again, yeah. I can understand it uh, why the faculty is so difficult to deal with. On the other hand, uh, the faculty has served uh, the, now in a non-ideological term, I'll say, as a conservative force of keeping the institution on the path it was yeah on. i suppose it is like I mean, tocqueville's analysis of the old regime right that i mean the nobles were problematic in a million ways but they were kind of bastions of a certain kind of liberty and diversity genuine diversity and uh in that respect i suppose all these department the yes, departments were bastions yeah. of independence and education and even if not everyone was doing a great job some of them were left alone to do a good job and so forth and i suppose what you're saying is the centralization leads to a kind of uh, stultification and uh, uh, lack of real diversity it makes it harder to have and, all, and again also the, the yeah also the ability to push an agenda uh, now one thing that's happening increasingly in universities uh, is uh, the change in the personnel of the administration I grew up in a world where it was fairly standard that the dean of the faculty was a member of the faculty and had built up credentials over years, uh, was respected by the other faculty, and that's why that person became dean. Now, it's very rare uh, to see a dean of a faculty emerge from that faculty. The argument is made uh, that such a person will be too attached to the institution, will not make the changes that are necessary. The assumption now in higher education is a corporate assumption uh, that things have to change. They permanently have to change. That no matter what's happening, it's wrong because it's been happening. Uh, and it is this notion of disruption, which has worked so well in Silicon Valley. Now you want to bring it uh, into universities. So typically now, uh, the it's always called the inside candidate for dean of the faculty. No matter even if this character is really respected and maybe even beloved, uh, he or she is in trouble, almost never can get the job. And the notion is we'll bring someone in to shake things up. Uh, now it usually still is a faculty member from elsewhere, but increasingly uh, business people are brought in, uh, lawyers, people who don't have faculty experience, and that's said to be even better because it's more disruptive. And again, there is certain truth to that. Uh, I would love to have my university with Peter Thiel as a president. Ain't going to happen, uh, but I could see how great that would be. Uh, but uh, that's not often what you get. And it's actually interesting that uh, when you bring people in from the corporate world, uh, there's uh, usually a reason why they're headed to your university and leaving a job in a Fortune 500 company. Uh, it's usually not that uh, they were doing so well in the corporate business world uh, that they want to go to academics. Uh, there was a point a few years ago where, uh, and again, a lot of these people are in th this multitude of uh, uh, organizational administrators. You can't even know who they are or what their title is. But I remember uh, as the head of a program, I was invited to this meeting with the new director of communications uh, at the University of Virginia, and he'd come from some very large corporation in the field, which I won't mention. I don't want to embarrass them, but, but uh, he was there to tell us that we were all supposed to be on message with the president from now on. Uh, 
that the president, and I don't even remember which one it was, had all these initiatives, and our job was to sell them. And I mean, this room just, there was a state of shock. I mean, we'd never heard anything like this before. We'd never been told we had to be on board with the central minister. And by the way, this guy didn't last very long, and there was a lot of pushback to that, and that's a good sign, and it shows you that you can push the faculty too far. But again, it's an emblematic moment, and it suggests what's uh, going on. And of course, you know, the... The down, there's a downside to decentralization, but there's also a downside to centralization. And this planning that goes on now, uh, it's really central planning and has all the defects of central planning. It involves imposing one-size-fits-all uh, solutions on things. It does not respect received wisdom. It does not respect the fact uh, that the faculty are in closer contact with students. We are often, in effect, getting orders from people uh, who have no contact, have never taught a student in their lives. Uh, and would know a student if they ran into them in the hallway. Uh, so, uh, so if this if this trend continues, and it sounds like it will, and I think the economics, and we don't really have maybe the time to go into this in depth, but the economics will probably continue to push in this direction, a kind of rationalizing and so forth, and cost cutting of you know, I mean, where does that? Uh, is it just a downward path for higher for the universities, and what does that then imply about education more broadly? I mean, we're. No, I think it's very serious. Now, one aspect that's very important is we're moving away from the tenure model. I mean, increasingly, uh, we have these adjunct professors and non-tenure tracks, and uh, in, it, it solves a lot of problems, but it creates them as well. I think fewer than 50% of American faculty are now tenured. It's certainly teetering on that brink. Uh, and you will see tenure remain uh, at the major institutions, but it's certainly being eliminated uh, at minor institutions. And of course, part of that is the economics of it. Tenure involves so much more money than just salaries. It involves all these benefits and above all, the problem of not being able to fire uh, people, you know, obviously uh, the good side of these so-called non-tenure jobs is they allow for some adjustment of supply to demand, that if a certain field has more uh, demand for students, you can hire essentially their temps. Now you can hire people to deal uh, with these temporary fluctuations in demand and not worry that uh, Russian is the flavor of the month in language teaching and tenure all these Slavic professors and then find we're at war with Russia or something and they got to be fired like all the German teachers during World War One. Anyway, uh, so as but but the result is the high schoolization of American higher education. That's where we're headed, uh, where uh, uh, things are going to be ordered from the top, they're going to be turned into routine. Uh, my mother was an elementary school teacher, a wonderful one, and I still remember this as a child. I was probably eight at the time, when my, my mother just says to me, lesson plans, <laughs> lesson plans. I've been teaching 22 years and never had to turn to a turn in a lesson plan. Now I have to turn in a lesson plan so they can review and see if I'm a good third grade teacher or not. And that has stuck with me ever since because my mother really was a great uh, third grade teacher. Uh, uh, and you know, we're, I don't yet have to turn in lesson plans, and I don't yet even have to turn in my syllabus though they would like us to give copies of our syllabus uh, to the chairs of our department and so on. And, 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 you know, I'm very lucky. I talk to colleagues at other institutions where, in effect, they do have to turn in lesson plans. And again, you can say that uh, this is necessary for quality control. And, and I will say that uh, faculty are paying for their sins to the extent they didn't teach well and live up to their obligations. They've now invited this oversight. I understand that very well. Uh, but the question is, is the oversight worse uh, right. than the lack of oversight? Because uh, uh, the, the, the people in charge here are coming out of the ed schools. Uh, and they, they have all these 
principles of teaching that they think are good, that I think are bad. Uh, but in right. any case, uh, why should they impose them on me? Uh, for Go ahead. So if the high schoolization happens or is happening gradually, and it'll happen more, I suppose, at lesser colleges and universities, but ultimately everywhere, um, maybe not at a few small colleges, What's the recourse? By the way, there's nothing wrong with high school, excuse <laughs> me. Some of my best friends are high school teachers. But high school is one but college, something else. But anyway, go ahead. Well, and the best high school teachers probably also rebel against their lesson plans and so forth, you know. But um, so what, I mean, what, we're having this conversation. Obviously, it's put up online. You've done a lot of online stuff, especially now with COVID. It's, everyone's doing some of it. So, I mean, well, some people think, and I've had this, entertained this thought, that some of the solution... I mean, you could have the closing of um, the closing of the American uh, of American higher education doesn't necessarily mean the closing of the American mind. For our, for our friend Alan Bloom, it did because he was so in his head. It was all the University of Chicago in the fifties, and then teaching at Cornell and at Toronto, and then back at Chicago. And and that's great if you can have that kind of uh, experience as a student and as a faculty member. But one can learn a lot even if the actual uh, colleges and universities aren't great, and and one can teach a lot. And I suppose so. I get to that question. I mean, how how what do you think of that? What could one make an end run around the colleges and universities to some degree? How possible in your experience as an actual teacher, of real students, is that? Or how much is it at the end of the day? You know, a huge percentage of eighteen, nineteen, twenty year olds are going through these universities, and and they still want to see people in in the flesh. And if they're not too good. The other stuff doesn't get done. I don't know. I mean, it's you know. It's, uh... No, I uh, uh, I've been very thrilled with what I've been able to do with online teaching, and also in non-university uh, teaching programs. Uh, I think, uh, in typical fashion, the market uh, is responding to this problem and coming up with alternatives. Uh, I've been particularly associated with either libertarian or conservative groups that have tried to uh, offer uh, alternative teaching in the in, in the summers. Uh, the best example for me is the Ludwig von Mises Institute, uh, the uh, Austrian economics th uh, think tank, uh, which is based in Auburn, Alabama. And they have something every summer called Mises University, and I've occasionally participated in it, or been there when it was going on. Uh, and uh, it's typical of these programs in that it's very self-selective and attracts extraordinarily good students because they have a purpose. Uh, they're being taught at best mainstream economics, but more often uh, left-wing Marxist economics in college, uh, and uh, somehow or other they've encountered free market economics, and their enthusiasm is just precious. Uh, and the level, level of discourse is very high. I was very glad to see that uh, starting this fall, the Mises Institute is going to institute an MA program because the, the limit to most of these programs that I know of is they are not degree programs and they offer excellent educations but not credentialing. And I was actually, I went in preparation for today and looked up how the Mises Institute is doing this and they're doing it through an organization of community colleges in Alabama which is designed essentially to accredit uh, operations like this. And believe me, by the, the faculty of this, or, of this Mises University is very distinguished. It's some of the most prominent names uh, in the Austrian economics uh, movement. Uh, and so these students are getting a real bargain. But now they'll also get a credential. I'll say this again, I'm very enthusiastic about actual teaching online. What is very difficult is how to test students online and then how to credential them. And that's, I think, the real challenge, and I'm glad to see that the Mises Institute has been doing this. I've taught for IHS in, in their summer programs. Uh, the, the great challenge with IHS is they advertise the program as the study of liberalism. And they, of course, meant classical liberalism, 
but they knew what they were doing to attract students. Uh, they got a bunch of liberals, and, and I, I really got in a lot of trouble one of those summers when the students really rebelled against my free market arguments. And when I defended Starbucks uh, by teaching the Harbucks episode of South Park, there was nearly rebellion in class, but I survived. But I taught for ISI, and they have a program at Oxford, uh, uh, and I've taught in uh, Roger Hertog's political studies program, and these are all they're all like all-star teams, especially the Hertog program. Uh, the students come from all over the country. They are so psyched for the experience, and they're so good. The level of discussions, they really do almost teach themselves, but I, I still get more of their word in uh, uh, edgewise. And it's so encouraging because you see how wonderful these students are, how much they want to learn. By the way, though, that, that does suggest the problem with online education, that the students have to be motivated. Uh, and they're basically having to rely on work, I think especially that high school teachers have done, uh, but college professors as well, the Hertog program. In fact, all these programs rely on networks of faculty around the country to recommend students. That's how you get the really good uh, students. But I worry about online education that students have to be studious uh, before uh, they can benefit from it. They have to have developed study habits. Uh, this is why I worry so much about the closing down of uh, 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 K through 12 uh, schools now that uh, I, I do not believe you can teach students online who have not already been, as, in a sense, uh, adjusted to the whole teaching experience. Now, for example, I do a lot of adult education. I never set out to do this, but uh, as you know, and because you helped set it up, uh, I have a website called Shakespeare and Politics, in which uh, we have up, I think it's 48 lectures on 17 of Shakespeare's different plays. Uh, and uh, we were really thinking of American college students in making this free uh, to anyone online. What has stunned me is that it's a worldwide phenomenon uh, I get emails from South Africa, from Lebanon, from Norway, from Turkey, all sorts from China. I'm evidently a big hit in China, uh, although they can't use YouTube, so they have to sneak me in somehow under the border. Uh, and I was going to read a few emails I've gotten, but uh, we'll, we'll skip that. I'll just say that a number of these emails say, you have changed my life. It's how deep it goes. But that can happen uh, with young always... people, too. I mean, why can't you take... So not oh. just middle-aged people. I mean, and some of them are young people. I No, I'm just saying what's a... What, but again, these are people that the... Uh, the the note usually says, I've been studying Shakespeare all of my life, but until I heard your lectures, I didn't understand Shakespeare. Well, the takeaway there is, I have been studying Shakespeare all my life. Uh, these... Uh, this site is not attracting people who are looking for the latest cat dancing or dog chasing its own tail videos. Uh, so, I mean, this is the problem here that we do seem to need this educational apparatus in place uh, to uh, essentially socialize people uh, into education. Oh, I thought you and think parents. What I mean, it is to study. I mean, just all you know, one teacher, a few parents. Look at Khan Academy. I mean, you could sort of. The question is how deep you could go with the online stuff or around the institutions. It seems to me to educate people. Obviously, in olden days, that happened a lot because very few people went to colleges and universities, and many people yeah. got good educations. And in fact, there were whole centuries or decades where the edu in England and France, where the and America, where the colleges and universities were sort of irrelevant to actual intellectual ferment, which was happening at the Royal Society or something in London, not at not at Oxford. Yeah. So, no. could you have no, I... parents saying, "Hey, I care about Shakespeare, and I've discovered this," and Mr. 10th grade kid, why don't you watch this? And while you're checking your boxes in your 
high school class. I mean, that's I guess for me the question is, no, for, at least for some elite, could you preserve the best of liberal education through the online yeah, efforts? I mean, that's what, again, what a lot of these emails say. Uh, some of them, I'm a high school teacher and I show your videos to my class. In fact, one of them contacted me from California uh, just about two months ago and I agreed to appear on Zoom to his high school class. And they thought it was awesome that this professor they'd been watching on TV was there to uh, teach them directly. So I do anything I can to encourage this. I get parents who say, I've been showing my videos uh, to your children. And, and by the way, I seem to have the right touch that uh, my lectures are accessible all the way from high school up to graduate school to other professors and so on. Uh, I think that's because I actually concentrate on the plays and what they have to say. But I agree with you totally. We had this discussion when we were talking about the Shakespeare authorship question that people think the man who wrote those plays had to be college educated. And it showed what a tremendous mistake that is uh, that somehow we've come to this point where if you don't have a college education, you must be really stupid. Uh, uh, and, you know, so many of the great scientists, uh, Michael Faraday, for example, one of the greatest physicists of uh, the 19th century was self-educated. Darwin was self-educated. He had a degree in something, but it sure wasn't biology. Uh, and I like to put the first professor of geology at uh, Oxford, uh, Buckle, uh, didn't have a degree in geology. Now that had to be true of the first professor of geology, but it does. I think we, uh, you know, for one thing, the the current system we have is maybe 70, 80 years old. It's largely a product of the 1950s, and in many ways, the 50s and early 60s were the golden age of American education, and they didn't last very long. Uh, uh, and there are so many factors involved. There are so many accidents. Uh, people forget that that was the age of the German and, and uh, emigres and other European emigres. We had fantastic faculty in the 50s and 60s who'd come over in the 40s fleeing Hitler. I mean, if you, University of Chicago was maybe the greatest university in the world in the 1950s, but that's because people like Friedrich Hayek and Leo Strauss were there. Uh, and when they were growing up, they weren't targeting Chicago as the pinnacle of their academic careers. Uh, uh, and that generation has died off, and the, the generation of their students is dying off. Uh, so uh, 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 I'm well aware that what we think of as the norm in higher education is really not very old uh, and has always had problems in itself. So yes, I mean, I, uh, I, I think all the time of how to get around the institutions. A friend of mine has, is working on creating a website for me uh, so we can post these lectures in another form and more importantly attract uh, the people who listen to the lectures to other things I've done. And I'm starting, I hope, in effect to self-publish that I'm taking lecture notes that I have and transforming them in effect to essays, and we'll post them on the website because the you know the numbers are not uh, going viral. I mean, I think the biggest number I've got on the lectures is twenty eight thousand people for the first Hamlet lecture, which is not, nothing on uh, uh, the world of e-commerce. They would laugh me right off Shark Tank if I wanted to get funding in this project, but that's a lot of people academically. Uh, uh, the biggest selling book I've ever written is my book on Hamlet, which is published by Cambridge and was designed as a kind of introductory book. I think that sold 7,000 copies, and that considered considered a runaway bestseller. Yeah, no, there's a quantity the and a quality world. issue. I yeah. mean, the one thing with the internet yeah. is it can get to a lot of people, and you never know when it's going to, and it's up there forever, so you never know when it's going to take off, and someone hears about you, and that person is himself or herself famous and recommends it, and suddenly you go from, you know, 5,000 views to 25,000 views. We've all had, I've had that experience a lot at the Weekly Standard and in other uh, efforts where, where things are online. But there's also the quality issue. I think this is, the, for me, one of the most least appreciated things that everyone thinks online quantity, in person quality. But that's not right because if 25,000 people have seen your lectures 
um, let's just stipulate that 95% of them learn something and it's great that they're seeing them, but they don't really, you know, they're not going to really study Hamlet in a deep way or Shakespeare in a deep way or Plato or Ro- whatever else you might steer them to. But, you know, if you get one or two or 5% to be, to really pursue this stuff in a really deep and thoughtful way, that's still a big number. So there's a kind of quality, the, there's a, the quantity has, can have, can't, not the dog videos, not that I, I mean, I like the dog videos personally, but, you know, not, the, the quantity, the, qua, the quantity can produce, if it goes to the right people, real high quality. There's a student at Harvard right now who I think encountered some, you and Harvey Mansell and others on our conversation series, and uh, it led him to, he's, he's from abroad, far away abroad, and it led him to apply to Harvard, and I think he's there now. And so, you know, this is a young man who I assume might stay in the United States and might be a very important contributor to our country, you know, seems very uh, impressive. So that's one tiny example, but that's where I kind of think that the quality side of the online effort is is underappreciated, I think. I wasn't going to read any of these emails because it sounds like self-promotion and patting myself on the back. But as long as you raise the point, I think it's interesting to demonstrate. And as long as I'm self-promoting, let's go all the way with self-plugging. And if these emails inspire you, just Google Shakespeare and politics and it will take you to the website and it's free. But okay, here are some of the emails I get. Uh, I've been listening to your Shakespeare and politics lectures, and I can honestly say that your insights are changing my life. Not only are you, are you illuminating the plays in a deeply profound way, but there's something in your lectures that offers up something to take into in my daily life. I don't know how to explain it, but you're broadening my consciousness and make my life better. Thanks very truly from the bottom of my heart for making these lectures available. Very seriously, each one is like a massive therapy session for me. It's also helping me with my poetry and playwright. You're playwriting, you're such a gift to the world. Well, no wonder you uh, wanted to read that one, you know. It's like, is that from well, your, the, the, from your, the, from your, uh, aunt, from your, which relative is that one from? You know, that's what I want to know. Uh, I, w- <laughs> I wish to express my sincere appreciation of online lectures. I watch them all several times, and I'll take them with me shortly on a deployment to the Middle East in my role as a trauma surgeon. Thank you for your work and scholarship. I consider you the leading Shakespeare scholar of our time. Uh, your insights have enlightened and stimulated my interest in Shakespeare, and I remain deeply grateful. What it does show is there's, as I would not have thought, that there's nothing about the online medium that actually interferes with the connection with students. I always thought that was the case, that you had to be physically present. But it turns out the technology is good enough now that they're watching you lecture and pretty much as if they've been sitting in the audience. The problem are all these ancillary things like giving tests and making sure they actually take them and uh, putting together a degree for them and, and so on. So I'm very optimistic about what online is making possible in the field of education. And it may be that a lot of our best teaching will now occur outside uh, the normal institutional world of higher education. That's the sense in which I am uh, optimistic. And un- unfortunately, the current uh, circumstances uh, with the coronavirus mean I think a lot of schools are going to close because they ju- there are many that have been operating on the margins and they just can't. Uh, you know, people uh, think this is an issue of whether anyone will show up. No, this is an economic matter, and so what happens on the margins is what happens. A 10% decline in enrollment at many schools that are already marginal will put them under. Uh, people think of this as a either-or situation, and it's not. And I actually worry about some of my colleagues who are in schools that are in financial difficulties, and they're just going to be exacerbated uh, by what's happening. Yeah, I mean, it, if you think it wasn't, I mean, it's very recent, even, I guess, Kojev, who was, you know, the great kind of counterpart of Strauss, who quarreled with, argued, debated at a very high level with Strauss about various things, wrote great books, gave great lectures on Hegel, was professionally a civil servant. And I, one can imagine a future, which has its downsides, I would say, because there's nothing like being able to be a tenured professor and really focus on your work and a long-term project and not feel the pinch or the pressure of day-to-day demands for, you know, uh, doing this to make uh, a little more salary, uh, at least not feel that as much, and, and, and have a long time horizon on one's work and, and teach good students if you're lucky to be at a good college or university. Anyway, all those things are great, and one shouldn't minimize if 
to the degree they uh, diminish, I guess, or diminish or go away. But I'm, I'm very heartened by what you say about the actual educational experience of online teaching. I think the seminar experiences w- would be a little different, but maybe that's somewhat manageable too if we get more used to it. The, the testing and all that stuff, so that seems to me to be doable ultimately. I mean, we'll figure out how to give tests and you know monitor them and so forth, and people already do it, in fact, a ton. Um, and a lot of, so I don't know, it's an interesting question. You know, books in a way, when you think about it in the old days when you didn't have a good professor, Lincoln or whatever, right? Didn't absolutely, didn't have the luck of studying with you, but uh, didn't study Shakespeare with you, but Shakespeare was fundamental for him. And he has a very intelligent comments about Shakespeare, somewhat limited, but uh, in a couple of letters. And he discovered Shakespeare because, well, at least books were printed, right? And in a way, the printing press was the original online education. You don't see the person you're, who's benefiting from it, but it allows Abraham Lincoln to read Shakespeare. He doesn't have to be in England in 1603, you know, able to go to the globe. I mean, so maybe there's a way in which, I don't know, maybe some of the deficiencies of higher education can be made up in terms of liberal education by making stuff more available and then and letting people know about it, obviously, and then maybe recruiting smart students. I mean, they would have to think about how to in an imaginative way that would go totally outside, though, the current channels. And that's a big challenge, obviously, to just to think about even, because we're also, everyone's so used to operating in, in well, well-worn well grooves and channels. Yeah, well, again, the, the, the other side of this is this credentialing problem. Right. That, and we're seeing this that uh, I'm surprised at how many students are willing to go to school online at the moment. I'll believe it when they show up, but everything that they're going to. And what it comes down to is they want that You mean degree. just for this for this ter- coming term in terms of the, the, the virus? Well, I mean, you know... Or the yeah, next term. Yeah, oh, you're not saying it, online. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The question would be, I mean, could you have well, an online college that, or partly online college that has the prestige of UVA or... An Ivy League yeah, that would be a big breakthrough if that. Yeah, the, I mean, yeah, if Harvard went online totally, and they're one of the few schools that might get away with it. Uh, you know, again, Peter Thiel likes to challenge Stanford and say, gee, you really have given students a great education. Why don't you just admit four times as many students it would be so beneficial you'd be aiding so many more students and he notices though they'd like him to write them a check it's not for that uh because they don't want to cheapen the degree and i led me to think about the the sort of paradox of education in any other field in the world if you're successful you expand uh if you're making a good car, you make four times as many of them. And, but you, you could be running the best school in the world, but you don't quadruple it. And you can say, oh, we couldn't get four times uh, these good professors. But that's probably not true either if you were making enough money. It really is the fact that these are little cartels. Uh, they're like the beers. They're trying to uh, rain in the output so that it keep the price up uh, and it, 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 in a way it's the saddest thing about uh, higher education that what are held forward as the most successful models of higher education do not expand right uh, do not and it tells you something that it's a prestige good it's an artificially limited good and a lot rests uh, on that uh, uh, so, uh, you know, you it's a sad thing that you could start up the best university in the world. Maybe you could manage to hire this astounding all-star faculty. But if its name was Fred's University, you couldn't get a student to go there. Unless you, I mean, that's the question. So, I mean, whether in the modern world, though, so I agree with that, and I think that's right. But cartels do often eventually break up, and prestige gets... T- t- change change what's prestigious changes and and the sort of uh, barriers to entry get overcome eventually sometimes by market forces and other forces in that respect the economic pressure the covid pressure the demographic pressure on american higher education could have a you know there'll be a lot of unfortunate effects of that I and mean, good people losing jobs and so forth and some kids not getting a good education where they might have gotten one 10 years before but they could also have that kind of creative destruction i suppose effect where you could imagine uh, the cartel being broken. I mean, I suppose if one were having this conversation about high school, I don't really know much about this, but, you know, 70, 80 years ago, 
sort of Exeter, Andover, Choate, and everyone. We, and, if, and if we had said 100 years ago, you know what, 50 years later, no one's going to care really if you went to Exeter. I mean, it's a mildly nice credential. There's a tiny bit of an old boys network. But at the end of the day, if you were at Harvard in the 70s, it, it, no one looked at someone from Andover and thought, well, he's probably better educated than someone from the public schools and, you know, lots of parts of the country or even schools you've never heard of. And certainly now, I don't think it has any of that. And could Harvard's and UVA's, they'll exist. They'll be prestigious places, but they'll be sort of like Exeter and Andover in a sea of other kinds of educational institutions that don't have that, uh, you know, and therefore they lose the ability to kind of enforce the kind of, uh, barrier to entry and, uh, and and credentialism, credentialing that they now have. I mean, it's not a great analogy, but I don't know. Somehow one can imagine perhaps something like that happening. If the law, if law yeah. tests are given online and if some guy who studied by himself or took three online courses from someplace you've never heard of and got some tutoring from a professor, does better than half the kids at Harvard Law School. I don't know. At some point, now people say, why, is, why are we paying three years tuition at Harvard Law School? You know, I mean... Yeah, well, on the other hand, so many schools are eliminating testing as a requirement because they think it's uh, unjust, and so we may be going the other other direction. I I'm actually shocked by the uh, persistence of academic reputations. That the 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 schools that are prestigious remain prestigious. You know, U.S. News and World Reports is a joke. They have this list of the top schools, and it changes every year. Uh, uh, and I, I want to say, what what happened right, in one right. year that Harvard dropped seven places and MIT went up three places? And the answer is someone filled out the form improperly and the number of scholarship students was added or something. I mean, the academic world doesn't change that much in a year, and it's all a marketing gimmick to sell uh, the issues and to in typical American fashion to think you can quantify things like schools' reputation. But what doesn't change uh, is the 25 schools that are in the top 25. Right. Uh, it, it's amazing how persistent that is, and that's somewhat concerning to me. Now, part of it is they're all going downhill, but they're going downhill together. Uh, and it's so rare to see a college's reputation change. You wonder what a college would have to do <coughs> to damage now, it's its reputation. I mean, it wasn't that long ago that Duke and Stanford and Chicago were founded. I mean, we you said before, you can't be Fred's University. But, of course, Duke was literally, I mean, if I can put it that way, no one knew who Mr. Duke was, I don't think particularly, or Mr. Stanford. So they literally were the Fred's University of their day. And they became very prestigious very fast. Now, one has the sense that everything it doesn't work that way anymore. There's a huge, as I say, barriers to entry and prestige, and, and partly because higher ed is conservative in the sense that their faculty are there a long time, and they select the junior faculty, and then the students supply, and they're told that it's prestig they graduate and do well because it's been selective, not because they learned anything necessarily, but because it was a selective application, you know, admission process, and therefore they're doing well, so the next group that applies wants to go there. So it's a little it doesn't change as fast as Google supplanting IBM, right, or or or, or Facebook right. supplanting, you know, uh, MySpace or whatever. But but I I kind of wonder whether we're at nearer the end of an era than in the middle of an era in which something we have for our adult lifetime something that's persisted, uh, but as you say is gradually declining. Uh, you know whether it could really be broken up in some ways, and some of those could be, as I say, there'd be some unfortunate effects of that, but also some very interesting and cha and heartening effects. I just see this personally with young people. They they think much less. Uh, they do reading groups, and they do them online, and you see who's really interesting and smart and who isn't. And somehow you don't think quite as much about, well, which, which place did that guy get his degree from? Now, could that person who I think is interesting get a job at a very prestigious university? That's another question, I agree. So that's sort of the next stage of the, you know, but look at history. I mean, the, the, the the number of best uh, of very well respected historians and books about the founders take a field I know a tiny bit about that are written by non academic historians now is really startling because the academic study of history went in a very specialized and you know way and all kinds of other things politics and so forth and so it turns out that uh, Ron Chernow who wrote the book on Hamilton and the, the book on Ulysses S Grant which I think everyone would, academic historians would say are very fine books. He's not a professor anywhere, you know? And if Ron Chernow and three other, and David McCulloch set up, hey, we'll teach you American history, and you 
pay something and you take a course, you know, and do it online. And maybe you get to come once uh, every semester to New York or Boston or Chicago or someplace. We'll have a meeting for a weekend. I don't know. That would be as good a history education as you get from signing up for a PhD, I suspect, in an awful lot of places. So, I mean, I'm just thinking off the top of my head, but I, I do wonder yeah. if you no, get I something mean, like that, you know. Yeah. And again, that's this category, adult education, which has been looked down upon for so many years uh, as something trivial and ancillary. And yet what it does show is there's an awful lot of people out there who want to keep learning all their lives. And it's really a noble impulse. Uh, and that is what is being facilitated <coughs> by online technology. I know so many people who talk about courses they they take online. And again, that's founded on habits they've built up over a lifetime uh, that allow them to profit uh, from it uh, and get something out of the online education. Uh, what I really worry about is what's happening with uh, uh, lower education. Uh, we're in a real problem at this moment of whether we're, we're abandoning a generation by not getting them into school schools where they can be schooled because in the lower grades there's there is no substitute for online presence uh, and you have to be present to keep the attention going i'm stunned that people listen to my hour and a half lecture there are about an hour and 20 minute lectures and they don't complain about it uh now obviously the group i hear from is very self-selecting and probably mercifully there are emails out there that have never been sent uh, how could you drone on for so long and never say anything? Yeah, you didn't read the you didn't read those emails. Why was that earlier on? Oh, yeah, I didn't read those. I, yeah, I was uh, talking about self selecting. I read the most flattering uh, ones. Uh, but uh, you know, it re it's really interesting to think about how disruptive uh, the coronavirus situation is going to be for higher education. Uh, because it may really drive a significant number of schools out of business yeah, and I think force the, others to reth rethink their, their business plan. The combination of the economics of higher education, which have gotten totally out of control in terms of price, I think, cost, and the demo demographic challenges that just fewer people in that age group now, the, class, the traditional higher ed age group, and now the virus, um, and the sense among a lot of people that, that kids aren't really learning as much as they should be, you do wonder whether it's approaching some tipping point and whether stuff could start to to change quickly. But uh, there are these big barriers to change. And then, of course, you don't want it just to get destroyed. I mean, to use your French you know, uh, nobility example, you don't really want a French Revolution and everything just gets wiped away. <laughs> You'd sort of like to have some ability to continue educating people. I think the young people thing is very important because I enjoy learning about music and art online and stuff. But it's still not the same as if I had been encouraged to learn it at age 16 or 18 or 20. You just can't learn as much when you're older and it's, you're not as uh, able to then build on that for years and so forth. So that I think is also a question whether, uh, but, but I, I, yeah, we should come, we'll have this conversation in two or three years and see if things have, I do think when the, yeah, when the virus hopefully is over, when the COVID situation normalizes, so to speak, where things start to shake out, what, what parents and students and t teachers have learned from this experience about challenging assumptions they had about you have to have all well, you know 10,000 kids in one town in these dorms you know because that's somehow what education is between ages 18 and 22 uh, and it wasn't always that right <laughs> it doesn't have to be that presumably you know so I don't know it'll be interesting to see where we are in a few years I think yeah I uh, I hesitate even to make predictions what I was to say there is a tremendous economic opportunity out there for some entrepreneur who really can think outside the box and come up with alt alternate ways of packaging education. I mean, there are there are plenty of people making money. On the, there's the teaching company, or again, that's the learning company. Uh, I mean, the, there are people who are coming up with interesting, economically viable ways uh, of taking advantage of this uh, situation. Uh, and maybe I'm right that that things will happen on the margin. And again, we're wrong to think that 
uh, we've got one system and then we're going to replace it with an entirely different uh, system. Again, just within the past 20 years, I've been amazed at the things that the Mises Institute is doing, IHS, ISI, Hertog's program, and there are many others. Many people have uh, imitated the Mises University uh, 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 model, uh, and I think it's an excellent model. It doesn't change everything at once, but it offers a viable alternative. Uh, uh, you know, two weeks of being taught East Austrian economics is definitely better than not. And, <laughs> and it's amazing how much you can teach in two weeks when you have as good a teachers as they have, uh, and how much, you know, they have repeat students coming back. Uh, uh, they've actually had some people who studied at Mises University and are now teaching at it, uh, and it can change people's lives. Uh, and it it's in a way amazing how little it takes to change people's lives. Again, I, I, you didn't let me read more and more of the emails of people whose lives I've changed. Well, you know what? When we uh, sign, when we sign but, off after this urge to get your, you can read them to yourself, and they'll be, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll uh, feel. You'll, I, I do that course, every night before going to bed. Uh, no, but it's, uh, it is a genuine. Well, uh, I, I appreciate what you've done, and I enjoy the lectures and uh, the conversations we've had on Shakespeare, and I, I do feel that it's. Uh, it's a real contribution. And yeah, but the question of how to, I think the adult ed stuff is easy to see, frankly, how one could really make a difference there. And, and, and we are making a difference. How to, what its relationship is to high schools and colleges and, univers and grad schools for that matter is, is a more complicated issue. And there, I, I do have the feeling that changes have only just begun. So uh, we will have to reassemble in two years, five years and uh, see if things have, you know, I think especially after this, vi yeah, after the COVID thing is, is over, so to see what begin to see what lasting uh, changes there are will be an interesting, interesting thing to look at. I'll draw one conclusion from what we've been observing, uh, and was really the thrust of my initial remarks about faculty governance. Decentralization is better than centralization. The most disturbing trend uh, in education is an increasing centralization of this. This comes from the federal government's intervention into higher education. Uh, it somehow manages to ruin anything it touches, and education is a great example of that. The idea that one size fits all, that in a country as large and as diverse as this, the people in Washington, D.C. could figure out how to solve <coughs> more educational problems uh, is, is manifest absurdity and a perfect example of what Friedrich Hayek meant when he talked about the importance of dispersed knowledge, the idea that someone in Washington, D.C. knows how kids should be taught in Idaho uh, is preposterous. And, uh, we've, uh, and so uh, what will help education is pressing the decentralization uh, trend, which we see in things like charter schools and homeschooling, <coughs> and uh, the idea that, uh, uh, to quote that wonderful thinker Mao, uh, let a hundred flowers bloom, uh, uh, let's try experiments and see what happens. <coughs> and uh, one of the sad things about the coronavirus is it's leading to centralization everywhere. The idea that some distant authority knows how to rule your lives and it's being manifested. The, the idea that we should have had a national lockdown on education. It's shaping up that way as it is, which is pretty sad, but at least there's some efforts to open up schools again in places where uh, it's viable. And so uh, I can only hope that the centralization trend loses out to the decentralization trend in education. Uh, that is just like any situation in the market, that the more alternatives are tried, uh, the closer we are to solutions, because there is no solution. The quest for the solution is the chimera here. It's the, the it's the false dream. Uh, and so we've got to open to the fa uh, fact that uh, even the idea that higher education is appropriate for all Americans is probably wrong. And we're seeing the consequences of that, of people going to college who never should have come, gone to college and coming out with entirely false expectations of what their uh, lives are going to be like. So uh, 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 I just would like to put in a word 
Uh, when I talked about faculty self-governance, I was talking about human self-governance. We need more human self-governance. Let people get back in charge of their lives. I think the faculty are a good image for what's really eating America's soul, the feeling people have that they're, they're no longer in control of their lives and that somebody they never met uh, is, is making the decisions for them just like my poor mother when she had to write those lesson plans when she was the best third grade teacher uh, in the greater New York area. Well, that's a good, a good, uh, a, a nice note to end on. And I'm sure she was an excellent teacher. I'm sure she was an excellent teacher even after she had to write the lesson plans, which presumably she just sort of wrote them and ignored them. So maybe that's one solution to sort of uh, She did combine. have beautiful penmanship. So those were the most beautifully written le- lesson plans ever, anywhere. Paul Cantor, thank you for joining me for this stimulating and thought-provoking conversation on higher education and education more broadly. Uh, and thank you for joining us on Conversations.